Uh, tonight, I'm going to be the presenter as well. Uh, I do a few presentations a year, and uh, um, I'm going to talk about the uh, speed as a feature uh, and uh, why it's num feature number one. And uh, hopefully, I will convince you to um, think about it this way. So, but before I do, let me open up this website. Okay. Oh, maybe something is up with my Wi-Fi or something. Oh, here it's loading. Okay, good. Good. But slowly. Yeah, it was a trick. So, <laughs> obviously, I, I hope you felt the same thing I, I felt, because it's basically I have this uh, very visceral reaction to the, this slowness every time I see it, I kind of I cannot stand it, right? We got used to that, but it's not an excuse, right? And um, that's why I uh, believe it's not a technological problem. It's actually psychological and the uh, UX problem that needs to be addressed and uh, needs to be brought up to the product team on the same level as uh, features or other features of the website, right? And by the way, on these devices, it's not going to be getting, uh, not going to be any easier, right? It's Sometimes it's even slower because you touch that device. You have a much closer connection to actual experience because that, you know, it's just not happening at the same speed as things happen when you touch them in the real world, right? Again, there are also other reasons for it, like networking is different, CPUs are different, but generally the requirement for speed is much higher anyway. And um, there are numbers that uh, maybe some of them, in some of you in the performance community know this pretty well, um, that show that uh, slowness actually damages business. Um, one of the uh, first researches uh, surfaced was Amazon's research connecting 100 millisecond performance, uh, I mean slowness, with 1% of sales. So every 100 milliseconds, one tenth of a second uh, that they tested it for, they lost 1% of sales. I mean, on Amazon scale, you can imagine how important that is. Uh, Yahoo Auto uh, section uh, released this research where they lost from 5 to 9% of traffic with 400 millisecond delay that um, uh, they uh, had, right? They've optimized it and then uh, realized that they gained all of this. Right. And Google, one of the interesting researchers when they compared um, Marisa Mayer actually presented that back when she was at Google. <laughs> she compared Google to Yahoo. Well, she's now with Yahoo. Weird, right? Anyway, um, uh, compared uh, Google search results with Yahoo's, right? And uh, thought like, hey, do we need more search results on the page? Right? Why not? Because Yahoo does more, right? Why not to do that? And they lost 25% of searches on that experiment. I forgot. They jumped from 20 to 35 or something like that. Not just a million, right? But insignificant. But, and they, they just couldn't explain it, right? And uh, slowness was the one thing that they were able to connect to this change, right? Because it obviously takes more time to get more search results. And on their level, they were already very fast. So 500 milliseconds was a, for them, huge uh, delay. Um, and they lost 25% of customers. 25% of customers, that's just crazy, right? It actually, uh, since it's on the very left uh, scale of the performance, meaning like they were very fast and they lost not too much, right? Half a second, we probably, on our business, we can kind of uh, juggle much, <laughs> many, uh, much bigger numbers, right? Um, but uh, the, the faster you are, the more you rely on that for your business and it's a competitive advantage for you. So, um, or disadvantage if you're slow, right? Um, and uh, another interesting research was done by uh, Google and Microsoft. I mean, I think the team migrated back and forth or something. Um, and uh, they introduced, uh, instead of improving and measuring, they actually introduced uh, a, slow, uh, a delay in user experience, I believe, on Bing. And uh, yeah, I believe it was on Bing, but I might end on Google on some of the services. For some users, obviously, not for all of them. And uh, up, to 200, uh, up to two seconds, and they saw uh, the degradation of user behavior, right? They started using the system less, right? Um, it wasn't about just just time to load or amount of visits. It's about clicks and revenue and things like that. But what's more important, actually, is that once they removed 
the delay. Those very users who had the delay before didn't come back to the uh, previous level of usage for quite a while. I forgot, the number was like six months or something. So long, it makes long-lasting effect. People kind of associate slowness with your brand and uh, don't appreciate the, when they need to wait anymore. And because of that, uh, uh, now we are glad that Google actually uses performance as part of the SEO ranking uh, for search and um, quality score for AdWords, where uh, if, you, if you're slower, your ad ads that you try to show will be more expensive. Right? So kinda, uh, there are many implications to that. That being said, it's not the main factor, right? Let's not go crazy about it. But it is involved in the Google's algorithm. So, um, moreover, speed improvement can improve your business, right? We can argue both ways, but there was great research or at least documentation of their performance efforts that Edmund, Edmunds did, right? And 3% to ad revenue and 17% of page view sessions after their full performance-oriented redesign, that is huge. And again, this was not a product redesign. It was performance improvements. They were able to isolate these numbers to performance improvement, right? All of these numbers are specific to performance, right? Um, Shabzilla landed 12% conversion improvement. I mean, 12%, how many product features or new product lines can you implement to increase your conversions by 20%, right? It's very hard to do that, while performance can do that without affecting the user experience. Uh, I meant the user features, right? No, no functionality is, is changes. It's speed of that uh, behavior. Moreover, on the, on the operation side, they saved 50% of their cost for operating the website as a result of the same optimization. Again, I can imagine cost of production is quite important to all of your businesses, right? And again, uh, Firefox, they are not selling their browser, but uh, for them, the amount of downloads and market penetration uh, is critical business metric. And they saw 15% increase after their performance optimization uh, effort, uh, with 2.7% for every second improved. They had a relatively slow side, but in, um, it was direct connection. They, er, they gained 60 more millions of downloads. It's additional 60 millions of downloads, right? How mu what is the price tag for that? How much do you need to um, argue for that with your business, right? When you see these numbers, it's quite obvious. You can put it on the uh, list of features and work with it. Now, all of these are technical and kind of um, analytical things. And uh, obviously, performance appeals to all of us technological geeks, right? We love it, you know, making things faster any day. But what's, uh, as you probably noticed, it also affects business metrics, so you don't need to actually take my word for it. Fred Wilson, uh, managing partner of Union Square Ventures, one of the uh, biggest, if not the biggest, uh, New York City venture fund, uh, gave a presentation about 10 golden principles of uh, software company, so web software company. And this was number one. He started his presentation with this, with this sentence, right? Speed is the most important feature. It's a literal quote from his talk, right? And he goes about uh, describing how um, that is critical for uh, customer experience and users using the product. So you don't have to take my word for it. Moreover, you might want to take it, but your business might not listen to us geeks, but they might listen to the person who distributes the money and helps uh, fuel the business, right? So, I, I believe all, every company has a list like that, maybe not in the spreadsheet form, but uh, there is always, in every business there is always a fight that goes on um, for the features, right? Uh, if, if it might be between parts of your organization, right, who, who will have their content on the page or their feature in or whatever, or it might be just for the budget. Uh, whatever you have money to implement that particular thing right now, right? So um, there is always a fight for this. I mean, some people call it uh, backlog grooming sessions, right? Some people call it strategical planning. Whatever, whatever fits your organization doesn't matter. But um, uh, to move forward with the resources you have, you have to um, manage this uh, process. And the challenge with performance is that. Um, it's invisible, right? Everyone feels it, 
but you cannot put a finger on it. You cannot create a mock-up for performance. You cannot uh, say, hey, we did something. Well, it's just faster. Well, isn't it supposed to be faster? <laughs> right? So uh, there is a significant challenge in pushing performance in your organization if you cannot, I mean, even to connect metrics to your business is already uh, requires already requires a lot of uh, commitment from a business. Um, but before uh, before that, almost impossible, very hard indeed. Uh, and uh, over my career with web performance, I uh, hit that wall quite a few times, and every time I find a technique that can help me push particular. Uh, part of performance forward, um, I'm trying to remember and kind of formalize that and try to expose it to others. Right, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, um, features that competing with the performance feature on that list, things that are uh, competing in a sense that it is oftentimes slow things down. And um, I do this. Uh, Fiverr exercise where for five bucks you can ask me for advice uh, and I'll give you uh, optimization uh, advice. Uh, similar to Meet for Speed sessions I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and I kind of uh, collect these problems. I see that some people have, uh, enterprise obviously will not use Fiverr, but <laughs> enterprise has uh, their own uh, version of the issues. But a lot of uh, businesses have their, uh, have their own share of particular problems that come up over and over um, because of the way we build stuff, because of the way product pipeline works. Right. So I'll go through a few uh, in in somewhat I don't know what order it is. It's a, it's hard to compare these anti anti features uh, really. So first one for businesses that use ads. Ads are quite important, right? Oftentimes, you might be a driven business and ads are your only income. Because of that, um, talking to people who push ads through is very hard. And ads are usually, uh, well, today the situation is a bit better. But uh, even a year ago, ads were a disaster. Uh, everyone's website is slow because of ads. If, if that's not true, you just can go into a cl quiet, dark room, think of yourself where no one is involved, and then you realize that it is true. <laughs> you know? um, and the reason, uh, like why I put it on a p uh, place number one is, that is not as necessarily that technology itself is complicated. In fact, ad, uh, advertising systems are um, having very precise uh, service level agreements where they define the timing it takes to uh, make a call, to return something, and they strive to do that uh, simply because people pay money for it, right? But there are other reasons like um, networks of advertisers where one advertiser passes calls to another advertiser and then another advertiser and another advertiser, as well as uh, just ancient implementation techniques, because these guys built it for a long time ago, right? We have ads for quite a while. That's why we have the internet, right? Be they were able to pay for our work. Um, and new improvements come very slowly. So um, I obviously fought uh, people who push ads through quite a lot. And when it's a person who pays your paycheck, it's very hard to fight them. That's why it's on the first slot, right? It's very hard to argue with people who just say, no, we, we brought in a million dollars. What are you talking about, right? And I wish I was paid that much so I could argue, but I couldn't. So there are two recommendations that you should start with, right? There is no universal way. And first one is get rid of document that right. Because that one was... Uh, for many, many reasons bad, but for performance reasons is very bad because it, it caused your code to be loaded at the very top of the page, right? Uh, moreover, it had to be sprinkled all over the page to inject uh, those uh, snippets that they were supposed to put into the page. And because of that, it triggered the browser to freeze. The browser couldn't optimize. Java, it basically passed over control to, to this JavaScript written God knows when. 
I have great news for you. I have an argument against that. How many of you use, uh, do responsive design? Raise your hand. OK. Others did already or just shy? No? OK. Everybody does the responsive design today. And um, uh, if, if, you, if you don't do responsive design, trust me, it will hit you with a hammer. So what it means, though, is that your pages actually need to adopt based on which device they're on. And document that right is just not compatible with that. Especially for ads, especially when you need to surface different systems, ad systems and things like that. So until responsive design came around, it was a very tough fight. And when it did, it was very easy. You just say, it's not compatible with responsive design. Sergey said so. That's it. You know, it's just not compatible. What are you talking about? And let them prove you wrong. You know, because they have no clue. So um, y you can just say, get rid of document that's right. And it worked, right? I mean, it, you don't need to talk in, the, in those sentences, right? It needs to be very politically correct and um, architecturally pleasing discussion, right? But uh, uh, that's basically the truth, right? So doing that, what does it do? It allows you to load your parts of the page asynchronously, right? You can inject pieces of the ads, and once document that's right is... It out, you can just target the uh, divs by ID and ins inject ads into there, into your page then. And it means that you don't have to do it upfront and can render page without ads before uh, the ad system thought of whatever it needs to think. And because of that, you can load the ads later, at a later time. Um, uh, when is a good question. That might be your next fight with them, right? But if you just don't tell them that you're loading them later and they eventually see it on the page, I mean, on load event or after primary content has loaded, whatever works for you is definitely better than before anything loaded, right? So just show them, hey, they work. Nothing wrong with here. So um, these are the arguments that work with the advertising teams. And... Uh, if you are on advertising team, and I know that we have some members of advertising teams tonight, um, just say yes, that's the truth. Anyway, it's very important, very hard fight to fight. You know, again, a lot of business pressure, but it's very important. So, next one, I call it anti-content. Right? Our group primarily concentrates on front-end because that's the majority of slowness is. But it's not always the case. And uh, in my experience, <sighs> WordPress has a special place in my heart. Right? Uh, most of the time, people who use WordPress use it for reasons or any combina whatever combination of factors is, but WordPress is usually slow, just period. Right? And a lot of people using it WordPress and Drupal and Magento, when they just, just use out of the box free solution, nothing wrong with that, it's just slow, right? So before page renders, uh, before page, sorry, is sent from the server over to the browser, nothing else can happen. Um, and uh, speeding up that part is critical, right? We call, talk about front end just because we have sites that don't have this problem, <laughs> right? But before you get there, you do need to optimize those systems. And um, um, another side of these systems is search result systems, because search, by definition, is a complicated topic. Whatever you're crawling, whatever, sorry, you're scanning your database for a particular query, or it's autocomplete, or, um, I mean, it, it's complicated. If you have a lot of data to search, it will take time, right? And so, it's a common problem for everybody where search results um, just come, come in late. I mean, first page will be very quick. You type in, hit enter, and you wait. And you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait, and then boom, you have all the search results, right? 20 or 35, it doesn't matter, it took a while, <laughs> right? So how do you fix that? So first of all, maybe you can use static content. I know it's a radical notion, right? But uh, for many publishing businesses, content doesn't change until you change it. Right? You just go in, type, editor creates a piece of content, save button, is hit. Why does it need to be loaded from database? Why do you need to do computation at the moment of serving it? Why not to do computation of, on the moment of creating it? 
create the content, optimize your final data structures, show it to the user. Nothing wrong with it. I, we actually used a lot of that at True TV, um, but obviously you might need to mix it with dynamic content. But let that piece of content be slow if if something is wrong. But if something is wrong, but make as much of it static. Requires a lot of rearchitecture. Definitely not your three-tier thing that you just got uh, learned in college and stuff. But it's uh, it's worth thinking about. Another one is obviously to every developer is obvious caches. Just cache it. Why do you need to do the thing over again? If previous user got the same result, why do you need to give it the same result to, to the next user? Or if it's the same user hitting the same content again, and it's very personalized, but it's for the same user, why do you need to recalculate it? And there are many layers of caches, like from uh, backend caches for code, for data, uh, like APC and memcache, uh, varnish, which is usually installed on your system and caches your HTML on the way out, or CDNs um, uh, that are now do that on the edge, closer to the user, right? Or even in the browser, right? For browser not to re uh, re refetch any new content. All of those layers are important. And there are even deeper layers like database systems have some caching layers and stuff like that. So cache is a great way to save uh, time, I guess. If you multiply it by amount of users and milliseconds you save, it's a lot of time. Think of in terms of your age, how long, uh, how much you saved, right? So every millisecond counts. Now, for those search, uh, search queries in particular, when optimizing the search experience, search queries themselves is just very hard, right? I mean, you should optimize them, but when it gets to the point where it requires breakthrough in science, what you can do is you can. Uh, Ask browser to render visual experience first, and only after that load the data. And there is obviously a way to do it with AJAX calls and things like that, but there are other techniques like flushing HTTP stream, top part of your page that especially if it refers to a CSS, um, CSS style sheet, um, for many reasons it's, uh, CSS is critical to rendering a page. I mean, obviously all of the UX people in the room would attest to that. Um, uh, it's critical to load it as fast as possible. You don't need to wait for search results to come back to know which CSS to use most of the time, or at least 99.9% .9 of your CSS. So try to flush the HTTP stream. It requires some server tuning and some um, uh, simple calls in your code, um, but it, it works well. So this article from this year's uh, Per Planet calendar uh, talks about these asynchronous fragments, both uh, both um, Ajaxy as well as uh, flushing. So you can check it out. It's called asynchronous fragments uh, rediscovering progressive rendering. Um, so uh, you can look for it in the calendar. And the last one is well, optimize your algorithms. If it's faster, it's better. Uh, I mean. Obviously, Google invested a lot on, uh, into their own algorithm, but not the algorithm might be different. So do everything you can to optimize that algorithm. If that drives, uh, brings you money, every millisecond saved will bring you more money, right? Um, so work on that. Obviously, ROI question is complicated when we hit the wall, right? Okay, another one. <laughs> I mean, probably you all loved my first slide, right, with a progress indicator. Well, it was a second slide, actually. Um, but this is common on the web apps uh, and mobile apps now. And uh, essentially, when you don't have the data yet, we all use spinners. I mean, I think now everyone has a bad reaction just to the spinner because it's overused, right? And I, I actually recently went to the site which had multiple pieces of content loaded on the same page. And uh, in every spot, there was a spinner. I'm like, I love to know that you have multiple mul streams. To, uh, anyway, um, but associating progress indication with uh, mechanical animations or whatever we can call this is not correct, right? Indicating the progress of download doesn't have to be like this useless thing, or even if it's linear and traditional, kind of blue, watery bar, and there's a lot of research on how the bar needs to move and all. 
Um, uh, and actually very valid research, by the way, very interesting. Like if it moves the backwards but pulses and uh, uh, I forgot what, it, what else, but anyway. Um, it's not necessarily delivering uh, in, uh, the same message as uh, natural progress would deliver. And uh, I'll mention it in a second what I mean by that. But the point is there are plenty of downsides of this approach meaning that it's not really connected to actual content you're loading. What is the spinner, right? Um, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so benefits that it provides might be um, counterparted by the uselessness of the actual image. So there are a few approaches that um, uh, Luke Robluski actually published a few of them uh, or talked about them. Uh, for example, Google is sliding the search results page from the right to the left while it downloads, right? Animation. And while it slides, you have experience, you have a feeling that the content is ready. It just needs to get there, right? But reality is, as you can imagine, it's just started downloading the results. And maybe it might use some other techniques to prefetch and start downloading earlier. But the point is that animation is natural, right? There is nothing wrong with that uh, experience of, oh, you're just getting the content, right? You have very normal, normal uh, feeling that, okay, while I'm getting the content, I'm okay to wait. Um, because that's, that's the work that the system needs to do. And it's not useless spinning work, it's actually getting the content, right? I mean, uh, obviously I'm not a psychologist and the, the research needs to be done into how well that works. And maybe there is no way to just connect the dots and you just need to try and see how that works. But essentially that's uh, one way of doing that and uh, uh, animation might be a good uh, approach here. Another technique, it's called skeleton screens, is not everything on your page is dynamic, right? Some content is actually uh, static. Moreover, it's unlikely that position of that content will change when content shows up, right? I mean, in some layouts, some layouts are very jerky and things change a lot, which you should avoid. Uh, but uh, clearly, on this screen, there are pl multiple indications of where content will be. And you immediately see, oh, I'm just waiting for that piece of content, but I can uh, start understanding where things stand and uh, start scanning the UI. And my eye is busy for those few hundreds of milliseconds while the content actually gets to, maybe even seconds. But the point is that by the, uh, by the, t uh, by the time full content gets here, and obviously images get, take longer to download, you kind of incrementally learn about content in the UI, right? You need to learn about both of them um, in your app experience, and it doesn't have to be content first in here, B simply because UI doesn't change from uh, during use, but content needs to be loaded from the network. So this technique is very interesting, and not only for the mobile apps, even for desktop apps. If you can um, fix your layout of the page as it would be when all content like images or video player arrives, uh, and just replace, let's say, black background with a playing video uh, when it arrives. It's a much better experience than if it was, will be collapsed in, in, in like zero size, right? And then player will expand. So that's the things that we have to work on our end at True TV, for example. And um, a lot of, we deal a lot with video, but I can imagine with every content, you can find that solution where um, uh, people just don't have an expected layout work which, by the way, is also uh, um, CPU consuming, so it by itself can uh, slow things down, but it's a topic for another discussion. Um, you can follow Google developer team, uh, Paul Irish, um, Paul Lewis, and those folks. They work a lot on, uh, on rendering performance. And we mentioned it a little bit in our, well, I mentioned it in our tools talk that we had in August, right? My favorite one. If you attended Meet for Speed, you know how I love carousels. <laughs> yes. So, um, what is wrong with carousels? What do you think is causing the problem here? Well, nothing is wrong with this one. It's rendered already. But uh, well, I can actually... Remember we talked about the feature fight, right? Carousels are a result of feature fight. If three departments in the organization need prime real estate on the homepage and no one can say that I am bigger than you, then they create a carousel. When it's the same piece, it just rotates, 
you will all have a share of user experience, right? And the newest one will be here, so no one says I'm, I'm the, uh, you know, um, I am getting the wrong amount of it, right? And just update it more often, right? So political reasoning for carousels is completely clear, right? The very same feature for it. But most of you are right. Essentially, it's a lot of content. Some of it is not seen. Moreover, the code for it, the actual JavaScript that enables it, usually comes pretty late in the game on the page download. And only then it starts to request images and assemble it on the pages. At least that's today's implementations that I saw. I don't see a single implementation that is from scratch done for performance. right? And they're just terrible. Uh, there was a great research by... Um, Sorry, not research, but kind of a showcase of Symantec, right? Imagine Symantec homepage. They sell a lot of software. And this gray screen where Carousel would be is there for like 10 seconds, 15 seconds. The whole, the rest of the page loaded, and only now the primary real estate is being populated by the latest software. What the hell? The user left already for whatever, McAfee, whatever, right? And uh, that's basically... What it showcases is that user experience designers, both graphic designers and the kind of product side of it, like on the, on the whole spectrum, need to think of performance as an integral part of that experience. Not only how fast it will rotate and how many slides they can have and how big are these buttons, right? Uh, but what is the experience um, overall? while things download? And yes, those images are usually huge because it's the prime real estate, right? Um, so, yeah. So, how to do it right? So what's different with this screen? Yeah, nothing much. It's the same slide, right? Same content you wanted to show. So why do we need for all the JavaScript uh, to wait for all the JavaScript? Why do we need to wait for the rest of the slides before displaying this and filling up this space, which is the prime real estate, right? Image tags are the best, the fastest thing ever. You just put in the image tag and just have it until the carousel code loads and converts this into carousel and start carouseling, right? There is no degradation with user experience. Yes, you're the people who got to second slide, I mean, the, the, the VPs of product who had their slide to be second will be upset. My 100 milliseconds users have to wait. Well, at least they didn't leave your site altogether, right? They actually <laughs> decided to stay and actually maybe were engaged for the 100 milliseconds of the first slide and not just like keep watching the rotating thing. So uh, speaking of those open source projects that I would love to be announced at this meetup, if anyone wants to really put effort into creating a very easy to use carousel with all the benefits of other carousels because there are some, some tools that have other benefits like touch and stuff like that. It's not an easy undertaking to do a great carousel. Uh, but why don't we create a fast one as well? You know, I would love to join forces on that, uh, share my experience and kind of figure out how to make everyone use the right one and not the, uh, the one that has the more borders or shadows or the most rotating thingy or whatever. Right? It, needs to, it doesn't need to be flashy. It needs to achieve the goal. Right? Again, as Matt said, the user experiences by off carousels generally might not be great. Uh, and, but the, considering that we have this political fight going on for that real estate, there's not much we can do. So, as I said, responsive design. If you didn't get hit by it, you will get hit by it maybe twice, maybe three times. Uh, so, Everyone gets responsive design. It's the cheapest, easiest, the most obvious right, way to get to the mobile devices uh, for a gazillion of reasons. The problem with responsive design is that um, many developers um, consider uh, the media queries, obviously, which is at the core of the responsive design and changing layout based on, on the pixel resolutions and, well, density and things like that. Um, um, they consider that as the only feature, right? And the reality is that responsive design is about the spectrum of experiences across of all of those devices. And when I say experiences, it's not screen sizes. It's all of the experience, networks, the, um, uh, physical screen sizes, not only pixel screen sizes, a whole lot of it. And packing it to all of those experiences into one piece of code that only use 10% of it in each device, right? It's just crazy, right? 
and it applies to JavaScript code that that is loaded. It applies to uh, tons of CSS that uh, that never re is reused, uh, never used at every device, uh, and things like that. And unfortunately, it's research. Actually, uh, Guy Podjarni, I forgot to add the link. On for, uh, sorry for that. I might send it later. Did a great with Ekam. He's with Ekam, my CTO of their uh, Web Experiences team. Actually, he released a good research about. Uh, Websites, actu responsive websites, actually not being done very well. They are slower than regular websites, and um, I urge you not to jump on responsive project without considering performance. It's just not right. So I'll give you a few tools for that. One is Tim Cudlick's book called "Implementing Responsive Design." I'm sorry. Here we go. Yes. Uh, so he, it was one of the first books, and uh, it outlined all of the front-end and back-end techniques and problems that um, you, you would face implementing the responsive design in terms of speed and how to, uh, to avoid that. He actually worked with us uh, at True TV when we did our redesign, and I'm glad we, uh, we hired him because it was, uh, well, in hindsight, I'm just... It was an amazing decision. We would die if we didn't do that. Because <laughs> it's, it's very hard to uh, know all of those aspects of um, layout and mobile specifics and things like that and care about performance and know the performance side. So uh, another uh, tool, which is not just a tool, it's just obvious statement. Just load just enough code. Don't load the code you don't need. And you will be surprised how much code is loaded, right? I mean, if you ever use network tab in your developer tools, which you should, right? L if, you, if there's only one thing you need to learn from this meetup is that you need to know what is being downloaded and how for your page. Just one thing, nothing else. You, you can leave the room now if, you, if you're really into it. You know, um, so you will be surprised how much stuff you load. And uh, in my experience, people underestimate how much they will be surprised with that. <laughs> it, it's actually very crazy. And especially in the responsive space where you kind of need this layout and this, uh, in this, uh, on this device, that layout on that device, touch support for these devices, menu this way on that device, menu that way on another device. If you have video players involved, it's just crazy. You know? um, so plan carefully how you're going to do manage your dependencies for particular pages how you're going to be doing builds how do you uh, how you're going to uh, um, package your code so only necessary code is loaded every time and optimize for caching as well it's a complicated topic i'm not going to go into detail about how to arrange that but cache is our friend and doing it right is important um, another one is using modern technology but what i mean by that is a lot of the little devices that we have in our pockets actually have a very modern uh, rendering engines comparing to older browsers that we had before. Well, IE, old IE versions are gone, so we can relax, right? I mean, 6, 7, 8, I don't know if you're, you're still uh, frustrated with, if you're already frustrated with 9, but 6, 7, 8 are gone. Here we go. So they're not going to support the, uh, anything other than the newest version uh, next January. January 16th. January 16th. So, so yeah. <laughs> That's another way uh, to think about it. Or you have to have a good implementation strategy in terms of, uh, sorry, upgrade strategy. Right. So, because they do provide the, all of that product for free, and um, uh, Chrome and Firefox got into uh, that. Uh, constant upgrade, up, update cycle. Good or bad is another story. There are a lot of bad things out of it. But good news is that a lot of the new technologies allow you to, to do things in a much more performant way. One example is SVG. Vector graphics to render your uh, some of the logos, some of the interface elements. It's compressible text. Gzip plus SVG does magic. Right? Imagine pre-rendering all of that for every device, nonetheless, right? Uh, and using all of those images is just crazy, right? So if device supports SVG, you might have a very a good way out. 
keep in mind the SVG support is complicated. You know, I'm not going to say much about it. I don't know enough and uh, ask Tim. <laughs> you know, but um, SVG is one good example. And there are many other examples like HTML5 video players instead of ginormous flash ones. Well, Steve Jobs, rest in peace. He actually solved some of this problem by just banning Flash. But uh, generally, uh, there are a lot of native capabilities in the browser that uh, often available user using HTML5 um, APIs that you can pr that you can utilize, including local storage and things like that, where they can replace very pricey network downloads and uh, uh, sometimes even uh, CPU calculations and things like that. And uh, as a product designer, the UX designer who creates the features, try not to uh, recreate the desktop one-to-one. -one. I mean, uh, some of the things are obvious, right? There is no hover event on a tablet, right? You can hover as much as you want on top of it, you know. Well, funny enough, some of the, d br br uh, uh, some of the screen developers actually created the technology that allows you to sense the hovering. Why? It's a completely different paradigm, right? They spend a lot of effort into it, and uh, there are a few devices out there that can actually do the hover thing. But for, for touch events, it just doesn't make any sense. So uh, make sure that uh, these things don't, don't just clutter your code. They'll load the one that you need for this device. Um, switch between them, and, and don't attach events where they're not needed. Things like that. It, again, it comes back to both network performance and how you load your experience as well as device per, uh, performance, how that device uh, runs, because the CPUs are pretty slow, right, comparing to desktops. So uh, sometimes, because the screen is small, you can actually reduce the functionality. <laughs> Luckily, I've worked with uh, some product uh, managers, and our content is very visual. Uh, as well, it just doesn't make sense for some type of content to be on a mobile, on a phone uh, device, right? You can achieve similar business goals with a different experience. So try not to go crazy about it. But be care as a developer, it will be somewhat hard and somewhat challenging for you to manage the dependencies and load, sorry, code loading paths and things like that for multiple experiences, right? So while it makes it faster, it makes it more complicated. Uh, I hope that one day there will be a simple solution for that. Well, uh, one of the last uh, features is images. For many of us in media business, and this is content from True TV, previous to latest redesign, uh, it's previous responsive redesign, I should say. Um, as you can see, the imagery is all over the place, right? But at the same time, uh, images on um, bigger device, uh, bigger physical screen device, and bigger pixel resolution device will be huge comparing to ones that are on a phone. And loading the same image for both devices is just stupid, right? But most of the people do that. Moreover, when Apple released their Retina screen back in when, I forgot when, uh, with 2x pixel density, they actually loaded both versions of the image to showcase how awesome the Retina screens are. But they loaded them on both devices, right? <laughs> on both uh, supported devices and, also, and so devices who don't support Retina, uh, which is completely crazy. But uh, you can hit those problems if you don't care about performance. And all you do is just you try to do the best with the available technology, just not understanding where the implications are. And I urge you to pay attention to that. And in particular, responsive images, because actually it is solvable. It is solvable in a much more straightforward way than doing complicated code um, loading techniques as we just discussed, right? Or something that um, requires a lot of mechanics. This is relatively simple. Small device, small images. Big device, big images. I mean, I actually gave a talk here uh, about a year ago and just recently at the Velocity conference about it, how we did that. and. Um, as a result of that optimization for that literally that screen that I just showed, uh, our source images uh, were four megs for home page, right? Four megs is huge, right? Designers upload the images, that's how big they are. And uh, you need to see the talk. Actually, I think it's actually uploaded to our um, YouTube channel, so 
you can. Um, but optimization for large already brought it down 50%, a little more even, right? But small screen got only 400 kilobytes, which is one-tenth of the original system, of, uh, of original size. I mean, one-tenth of the download. You don't need to argue what's more important, bandwidth or latency or whatever. If it's 10 times smaller, it will download faster, right? There is no argument here, right? And I highly urge you to look into responsive images and um, luckily uh, standardization around it, uh, I should say finished to high degree. Well, finished is never right word about standardization, but um, implementation is already available in both um, Firefox, well, sorry, Firefox, I believe, is not production for everything. There are a few, uh, so there is a subset of features which might be enough for you uh, for the responsive images standard uh, that is available in Firefox. Uh, I believe Chrome supports all of the features currently standardized. IE has some support. I might be wrong. I'm sorry? They will this year. That's right. Yov Wise gave a good present, present actually a couple presentations at latest velocity uh, uh, past fall about all of the details of implementation, which which one you need to use, which feature of the standard you need to use for which use case, uh, what is the support level, and he actually works on implementing a lot of them. I think right now Akamai sponsors his work for Chrome, if I if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, implementing that into the Chrome system. All right. Um, so, yeah, by the way, uh, Responsive Images Commuting Group is where a lot of standardi latest standardization came out and a lot of work uh, where Yov and a few other people um, put in uh, came out of. So go to that website. The um, picture fill library was developed by other people, uh, um, by Filament Group. Um, Scott Gel uh, specifically, and it's a new version that actually supports the standard. So um, I really encourage you to look into that. Enough said about that. I would say there's plenty of talks to be had about responsive images, and in particular automation and things like that. So, uh, so these are primary anti features that would decrease performance if you don't pay attention to performance when you implement them. The business comes in, they have the buzz, they hear what's going on, they bring it on, the bo on board, or uh, a lot of powers in place that try force you to do uh, uh, this uh, anti-features because, well, for good reasons, uh, supposedly. And uh, if you don't put research into how they perform, you will decrease performance, which you com can completely negate the experience if there was, sorry, the effect, if there was one planned anyway. But performance uh, degradation can be dramatic. I, and I mean it, dramatic. Like, I believe Disney responsive side was 90 megabytes first time around? Nine zero? Yes, nine zero. So just saying, right? I mean, they fixed it since then. But uh, uh, there are examples like that. And you need to be careful. Uh, not paying attention to performance when you plan your user experience. Again, it's about user experience. All design, implementation, all of that is about user experience, about uh, making it easy for them to perform the actions you want them to perform. For good or for evil, that's up to you. All right. So in order to accomplish that, you, there is no way to just say, oh, today we are doing performance feature. Once we're done, the rest of them can be worked on. You actually need to establish speed culture. And there is, the, I mean, Lara wrote a whole book about it. There are a lot of talks at Velocity about it. It's not just one single simple like switch. Culture established, right, um, thing. So you need to actually uh, work on it incrementally and over time. Uh, I found that you need to both try to uh, work from a business metrics perspective, uh, convincing business that uh, performance benefits uh, the business in real tangible thing, tangible, whatever tangible is for you, page views, dollars, whatever it is. Um, at, at the same time, keep in mind that it's often hard to get there. Uh, Tom Gerhard, uh, who is not here tonight, gave a good talk about the experience at Priceline where they did that and how they use metrics to do that. Uh, so there is another approach. Yeah. 
Yeah, I will in a second. Yes, thank you. Um, so there is another approach is um, approaching the uh, uh, from implementation specifics, right? All of you or many of you are probably de actually developing the, your properties and work closely with developers. So uh, establishing those techniques, um, learning the tools that are in the place, and over time, um, it will become obvious to everyone who implements the system that performance matters, right? Um, in, in addition to that, as Alan pointed out, there are a few uh, ways to um, establish tooling to help you keep an eye on performance. And they involve, one of them is a Team Cadillac, actually, <laughs> tool uh, called uh, Perf Budget, uh, sorry, Grunt, Grunt Perf Budget. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Grunt? Quite a few. It's a build tool for front end, right? So. Um, uh, Grant Perf Budget allows you to run a web page test as a most popular tool out there uh, to analyze your current state of performance on every deployment, on every build, right? And just to make sure that you don't, your performance doesn't degrade. So um, you are, you should check it out. But there are other tools, like I mentioned, real user measurement um, uh, tools that let you see how your performance changes over time or how it is distributed among all of your users because uh, per grant per budget and other synthetic tools, they give you one measurement for one environment, which might be very detailed, but um, not necessarily representing every user. And you might be very wrong if you use just that one number to do things. Synthetic is better for analyzing the causes uh, of the um, problem and not really uh, to uh, extrapolate it to all the population of your users. So RAM. <coughs> Sorry, provides that visibility into all the users, and if you collect all the data, which you sh which well, some people say you should, some people say you shouldn't, you can slice it up and uh, do A/B testing on top of that and compare um, uh, user experience with business metrics as well. I think that's so. So there are a few ways for you to um, do in, uh, informed performance effort, right? Not just inspired. Right, not just the one where you improve things because you know it will be faster, but the ones that where you can prove to everybody that those 50 hours that you spend are actually a saving and not really a, a, a thing that you went on a tangent and did because you like development and technology. Right? It's critical because at some point, well, very quickly in performance optimization uh, career, you, um, uh, you will see that it gets complicated. It takes a lot of effort, like our Im image, image optimization effort at True TV, even the relatively small, took quite a while. T took a lot of resources from those other features. So you need to prove to your business and keep track of that. So Meet for Speed is our hands-on session, um, uh, Web Performance New York, while well, you're here. Um, but uh, what you can do is also establish Meet for Speed sessions in your organization. That's how they actually started. I started one at True TV, and every week we just look at performance, right? Discuss the techniques, discuss projects, look at how it degraded, which it will unless you do uh, <laughs> improve it, right? So uh, make it a common thing for you to do, like learning general technology, like, uh, I don't know, uh, automated testing or whatever. Make it common in your practice to look at performance. So. Uh, that's all I have today in terms of slides. Um, I can answer some questions. Uh, yeah, we're kind of short on time, but so I can open to questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question was uh, um, at which point um, uh, the using responsive images technique uh, that today costs you some JavaScript uh, download and JavaScript execution outweighs um, the value of it, right? When you should no, uh, you should probably do that for, with smaller images. Uh, uh, sorry, use one image instead, um, which is just one request. Um, there are a couple answers to that. If you don't have images on the site, you don't have to use that JavaScript. Uh, basically, what I'm thinking is. Uh, a, JavaScript code that you would use is most likely cacheable among your pages. It will download once, unlike the content of every image, right? 
B, modern browsers, new browsers will have support for it, so you will not need JavaScript, right? And downloading that and executing that will not tax you at all. It will just not kick in, and browser will pick it up on its own. Uh, second of all, the script is actually small. I mean, if you have one image you serve and it's the only thing you do uh, and it's three kilobytes, yes, that's not a problem. But it's, un it's unlikely to be a problem anyway, right? That's not the use case that we are talking about. Um, you will be surprised how big is the difference between large image and small image in terms of file size. Um, and since they are not compressible using gzip right on the wire, they are already compressed by, by the nature of the formats. Well, at least you should be using the formats that are compressible. That's already compressed, right? Um, uh, you also need to compare gzipped version of JavaScript to uncompressed version of the image. And it's l unlikely for you to ever have a case where it's the opposite. You know, that's my opinion today. Uh, I think everyone on the Responsive Images Community Group thinks the same way. So, uh, What I can say is that complexity of the code that you will be implementing and not only the picture field itself, but this content management system that needs to serve different versions, right? That one, in terms of re return on investment, can be a complicated uh, question, right? Because that's expensive. That's what we hit. Our system is quite complicated, so it requires some significant maintenance, and actually doesn't achieve as much. We, we only chose automated piece, automated side of the business. Again, there's a lot to talk about there. Um, yeah, but it's already a pretty complicated solution. So what you might want to look at is automation tools. That's where uh, image, uh, responsive images shine the most. It's actually relatively easy to automate, right? I mean, it's complicated software. You can look at the Akamai solutions. There are a few others, or you can use it, uh, look at open source mod page speed solution that has responsive images code. It's complicated. You pr you do, it's not obvious. You will probably not want to create it on your own, right? Um, to automate it in the fly, but you can get a lot of benefits from custom formats where each device gets its own format as well. If it's WebP it's, or what is it, most JPEG is the latest format for Mozilla and things like that, right? Um, so back to the short answer, there is no use case like that. <laughs> so what are the strategies for parallelism and are there any gotchas with that? Well, um, parallelism, I mean, there, are, there is obvious one. I mean, figuring out what, to be, what needs to be paralleled is actually a complicated question and might hit the same, uh, same complexity problem, right? Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, if, you are, if you succeed in creating the pipeline of things that most important things load first, then parallelizing as much as possible is, is good. Except that it's never in vacuum. It's actually on top of existing standards, like we discussed. The TCP IP standard is probably hard for you to replace, right? Um, and um, especially in every network infrastructure, as well as browse end user browsers and things like that. So you might be on TCP IP protocol, and parallelizing on top of TCP IP is a whole different story because of slow start, because of uh, things like um, security where multiple streams might not be actually appreciated as much, um, although I, didn't I don't know enough about the security side of it. Uh, so, uh, good rule of thumb is that latency becomes your problem much faster than bandwidth today, right? Because distance at which you need to transfer it is much bigger or pro. I mean, usually it's not next to you, right? That's the whole point of the web. Uh, while bandwidth can be improved, distance is still there, and we are not getting any new <laughs> technologies anytime soon that uh, perform much better than, uh, than uh, optical cables. Um, so parallelism might not be solving enough, you know. Um, and for example, HTTP protocol, HTTP 2.0 protocol, we actually had a presentation this summer about it, um, uh, actually reduces the amount of parallelism of TCP connections um, in order to reduce the latency, right? Mike Belcher did the research originally for Speedy, and I believe uh, uh, Andy Davis is doing research now, uh, updating it, um, about when do you hit the barrier, uh, the when do you top the bandwidth? And funny enough, 
four or five years ago, it was two and a, f two and a half megabits per second. After that, web traffic doesn't improve, <laughs> you know, uh, while latency is linear. The smaller it is, the faster everything is, simply because of number of assets that you need to download for every page. Right? So the easiest way is not to have uh, as many assets, use the latest technologies, just tell, tell the browser, do all the work, and that would be enough. You know, don't, don't do the work for it. I mean, uh, it's not a simple question like that, but yeah. Yes. Well, there are a few questions in the viewers, actually. One is whatever uh, images can be loaded in low resolution uh, and the can be improved later. But another question is whatever uh, uh, browsers actually load them uh, sequentially, right? Which they're not. They actually load them in parallel, you know, and uh, especially, and you kind of, if you master enough how you load them, you can actually control in which sequence they load. Especially if you can postpone some of the, uh, some of the assets just by the nature of your application. I doubt people can want to see all of your images right away, right? Uh, so some of that can be done on interaction. Like the famous case is uh, the watches that people wanted to zoom in on before they buy, but when they want to see the list, they want a thumbnail, right? But they want a really high-res image when they want to review a particular uh, watch, right? So uh, some of that can be an optimization technique, and you know. Um, uh, now, whatever you want to load, the low resolution and then high resolution, on the mobile, you probably don't want to do that. Uh, there is progressive JPEG as well that you can try utilizing, uh, which improves as it downloads, so it's kind of both versions in one file, right, uh, without overlap. Uh, the trouble is that um, you might not actually get better user experience, right? Um, Tammy Everts with uh, Web Performance Today blog, um, uh, she works for Edware, uh, she gave a great talk uh, about um, perception of image experience also including p image optimization, some parts of that. Um, and uh, she actually reviewed, resp uh, sorry, progressive JPEG. And she found out that users actually do not like it. They like it less than waiting for smaller image. I mean, optimize the, I mean, there were a few techniques there. Um, so uh, it, it's hard to say, I mean, they tried to rationalize some of that, but they said that it's only the first research like that. It's hard to say, hey, user did that for this reason, right? You know, you never know. Um, uh, but uh, the assumption is that um, the fewer amounts of, uh, fewer actions of work that user needs to do to see something is better. And if you show them lower quality image, they want to analyze it. They don't get success because the image is low quality. And they need to go and analyze it again when it's a high quality. And then is, what it resulted in is actually less satisfaction. They did some actually very interesting research with like facial recognition of micro expressions and things like that. So it was pretty sophisticated, as sophisticated as they could, they could manage. They funded it and some independent company actually did the actual research and stuff like that. So there is no simple answer in terms of uh, res progressive JPEG in that sense that speed is not always better experience. Better experience is what we need to achieve using speed, right? So uh, that's the basic answer to that. There, yeah, there are techniques, but on mobile you probably don't want to use them, right? Because the cost for establishing connections is much higher. The uh, Well, some people actually pay for bandwidth. <laughs> like Tammy is actually from Canada and they, she pays pretty hefty price, especially when she travels to US. So. Generally, if you can avoid downloading it altogether, it's better. Uh, that skeleton experience, skeleton screens, I believe it's called, right, uh, is a good thing to do um, because you kind of need to expect something to load, and that that signal can be delivered by gray background or whatever colored background. Actually, I remember some re some people did. Um, they actually pre-calculated the average color uh, for the image up front. Uh, when the images were downloaded and they used the hex color on the page for the background or something like that. It was, I believe, for smaller icons or something. I don't remember exactly. I think apartment therapy did that for some of their awesome photos and stuff. So, you know, th there are multiple techniques that you can figure out to 
think of how user experiences the process of loading the page, right? Don't think that Photoshop file is what they get, right? As many designers today do, and uh, it will not it will not be gone for a while. Yeah, Chris. yeah uh, there is uh, a huge aspect of um, basically when we talk about responsiveness again. It's not about responding to the amount of pixels you have, right? It's about responding to the har uh, exp to environment that the user has. And that environment includes network. Obviously, mobile network is very different. It uh, includes uh, CPU and other uh, and battery properties of their particular device, which we all know phones are very different. And uh, unfortunately, it's much harder to analyze and instrument those properties, but there are tools now and stuff that you can use. Um, you need to make sure you don't reduce their user experience again, right? Um, and many, like Chris pointed out, images actually need to be decompressed. They need to be resized. By the way, resizing them onto the right size is also a very important thing to do if you can achieve that. Um, the actual device is actually doing a lot of work before it can render the, uh, render the um, uh, bits into pixels on the screen, right? So uh, I, I would think today it's an advanced uh, thing for you to be able to predict and analyze that. Um, but generally, um, try to do the work for the mobile browser before uh, you give them the file. I don't know how to formalize it better, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, uh, I actually spoke to some IE engineers at the Velocity Summit, uh, I think, last February about it, and they said that it's actually not very well documented how much of that is hardware accelerated, how much of that, uh, how much of that is going on, actually. But, but since then, both IE team and Google Chrome team, um, well, Blink, I guess, team, uh, did a lot of work in trying to surface this data. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, in in the industry it's called M dot sites, right? Uh, so yeah, so M dot versus responsive is a complicated question, right? Essentially, what uh, as as I mentioned uh, when I discussed why it's risky to implement responsive design is that the assumption of using the same code, therefore simplifying your stack dramatically, uh, is somewhat wrong because some of it is incorrect, right? It's not simplifying, but then you need to worry about a lot of things, right? Same goes about mobile and dot sites. Essentially what it means is that um, you need to maintain another layer of abstraction in the middle, right? Moreover, you, as a t as the owner of software, uh, need to actually manage the ever-growing world of devices and support them all, right? Again, you can have a, ver a business that does it for you. It's a perfect opportunity for vendors to step in. Uh, but that layer sometimes produces dramatic uh, complexity and therefore brings rigid rigidity to your development as well. So the, even though theoretically you would say that, yes, website optimized just for this particular device is the best, uh, in reality, it fails at 600,000 devices out there, you know? And essentially, it can only be, if you think about it, essentially it can only be efficient if your tooling is as smart as all of the devices that basically devices can uh, kind of go into complexity this way and your tooling need to revert that, right? So it cannot be done, <laughs> if you think about it. Basically, um, uh, it cannot be perfect. How far you can go that route is a different story. And some M dot sites are still popular and still actual. And if if you as a product owner um, can spend money on um, developing multiple versions, and there are techniques like hitting the ma uh, sorry, sorry, hitting the master, no, breaking the master. Ah, crap! I don't know English enough. Um, cutting the master. <laughs> That's the technique. <laughs> cutting the master. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, when you kind of split your ecosystems into devices that support those new technologies that I mentioned, right? Support that uh, responsiveness, prop responsiveness properly um, uh, and have big enough screens to present better experience, right? Uh, and better connectivity. If you kind of uh, do 
uh, one approach for those devices and do degraded experience using M. Dot sites for the smaller devices. I believe Boston Globe was a gr uh, great example of that. If you others, I don't know enough. I think fil Filament Group are people who do that. So cutting the mustard is a good experience, especially if, to, if you need to support IE8, right? Where if you ask my developers today, they will kill me if I ask them to support IE8. They will never go back. Never, never. Basically, we cut out so much code and we re actually rebuilt from scratch most of our code to not use techniques. Uh, I'm not talking about IE6. That's just, I mean, rounded corners in IE6. Uh, people were like, Well, brand, how it will be branded is another story, which can actually bring God knows what to the table. But uh, the good news is that the A-team is actually very active, right? And they're very involved in the, com in the community. They're very involved in developing better browsers. So luckily, we don't have to bash the word AE anymore. Still a habit. Yes, that's right. Google actually uh, um, likes M uh, responsive sites more, right? You can argue that Google has their own interests that are not necessarily your interests. And, uh, um, well, I, I don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. So I don't know what the motivation is. Uh, definitely performance is better. Right? And the faster experience is better. And a lot of M.DOT sites use redirects to, like as, you, as Ronald mentioned, cookies to determine uh, the devices and kind of degraded even more, right? Implementing M.DOT site is maybe sometimes hard, similar to responsive site, right? Doing it right is hard, right? So, um, but Google has other motivations. For them, single source of data is more very important, right? I mean, um, think of it this way. If you have a URL and I share this URL with you, Will, should you go to the same URL or to a different URL, right? I was on one device, you're on another device, completely different, like very, uh, today it's completely obvious example. Uh, you know, I shared something on Facebook from my desktop and you looking at it on your tablet or on your phone. You cannot do that. I mean, one example was WebP had some, uh, Facebook hit uh, some snag with WebP when people were saving the images as web in WebP format and sending to them to other users who didn't have the Google Chrome who who supported that, right? So, <laughs> uh, I wish it was simpler. There's so much technology. I just like, why do we need to know all of that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the question was for iconography on your site, uh, which route to take? There are a few solutions, uh, CSS sprites with images, um, yeah, with basically uh, one image representing all of the Im all of the pieces of the iconography, uh, but still raster images or um, SVG or CSS. I'm sorry, uh, the fonts uh, with uh, how's it called icon fonts. Um, my opinion is that fonts are actually not implemented well enough, and then. To implement them properly it was actually hard. You probably saw, I mentioned the, I actually forgot to mention the flash of un, unstyled fonts problem generally on the web, right? With all the incorporation of fonts, I just don't have enough research to put on the table. I, I should actually, um, but that's a huge problem today, right? It's a little different from iconography, uh, icon fonts, right? But it's a general font implementation, right? So uh, at the same time, if you, uh, fonts, for uh, icons, so, uh, uh, great implementation because if you need only single color uh, raster, uh, sorry, vector images, fonts are actually a good solution. I would urge you to pack your fonts to just contain characters you need. Uh, Fontello.com, I believe, is a great resource. Uh, it has all the open source fonts on it that you can just pick and choose, but you can also upload your own, and it returns you a font that only uses what you need. Right? So for icons versus regular fonts, uh, you can pack them if you pack them well, if you compress everything, if you do it properly and load them, and, um, and maybe until they load, you kind of use some other representation of the um, icon, right? Um, it can be a good solution. Um, comparing to just standalone icon images, definitely better. <laughs> you know, standalone should definitely be comp compiled into a sprite if, if you don't have any way out, if you need multicolor images or animations, God forbid. Yeah. yeah. So SVG might require 
more development, but uh, it's uh, uh, and support. Well, if it might be comparable in terms of support as well. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any other questions in the networking session. Thanks a lot. Uh,